and welcome to the 2025 season preview. It's going to be a massive show, and I can't wait to, to get into it. It's going to we're be great. Do all 18 teams. Uh, we're going to do an in-depth analysis. We've all written, I believe, we've both written our 4,000-word essays uh, for each team, of course. So yep. um, if you'd like to start going. Uh, let's start at the top. <laughs> Adelaide. Shit. That does not sound like 4,000 words. Eh? <laughs> well, there's still 3,998 words to go for everyone else. I was talking 4,000 a team. Clearly, there's been a miscommunication here. Oh. oh, oh. I, was try- I was meant to just, just try and do the maths to try and times 4,000 by 18, and I couldn't fucking do it. So. <laughs> 72,000. That's the one. 71,998 words is the rest of the team. So. <laughs> hmm. No, no, we're here. Of course we're here. Football sucks, though. Um, it's a little bit depressing. So, yeah, we decided to, when I announced it, to say that we're doing this, you know, a few days later because we had commitments such as footy trip, Mad Monday and so forth, but in fact, we um, played it because I spent 72 hours crying. In amongst other things, <laughs> in amongst the flea trip that did actually occur. Yeah, but... the Mad Monday that actually occurred too. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> but obviously, sad times. Um, when it comes to when it comes to obviously the pair being out, which means now both of our teams are out. I'm, I was I've been on holidays for a lot longer <laughs> than Anthony has, which is you know it has it has different things. I was able to come to terms with it earlier, I suppose. But you know what? I suppose you've done your review, which if you haven't seen it, I'm doing the plug already. There you go. We haven't even done the intro music yet, and I've already plugged the already plugged the uh, the review. Um, obviously, after everything, I still think. You know, and I know, you know we probably won't touch on the, the loss all that much, but I think season as a whole, I think is probably still a pass for for the pair. I would say anyway. Glad we're going straight into it without even smashing the glass. It's really just. Yes, well, we're back for episode 63, Jared, and it's incredible that we've made it 63 episodes considering the amount of shit that we've talked and things that we've said and rumours that have been made and controversies that have occurred and <laughs> yeah, we still can't get an invite to the brown line. I'm filthy about it. I've been seeing all these all these people at the table like, how are we not in there? Um I feel like what I'm going to say later on in this episode when it comes to the stupid sexy segment of the show is probably the reason why I'm not going to be in there. However, uh, I, I would love to be involved uh, in the Brownlow in some case. So this is our immediate petition now to the AFL to let us in next year, please. I know the security kicked us out when we tried to break through the door, but let us in this time <laughs> and we will be there. Trust me. I will, I will be on my best behavior. That's because we try to do it on the wrong day. Yeah, that's true, actually. We were just smacking on the door of the cramp palladium on Sunday. You were there for the brown one. I was there for my money back. <laughs> you took like all my Andre cash. <laughs> just that Eric Andre meme just, like, shaking the gate. <laughs> Let me in! <laughs> <laughs> you look to the right and the doors are just sliding open. That happened at like 2 a.m. on a Saturday, just like next to the wide open door. <laughs> We're actually just pulling on one of the plants. Let me in, let me in. That poor plot plant. Oh, uh, it was never, never stood a chance. <laughs> nope. But, you know, it, it occurred, so. We might as well talk about the brown though, since we're just going to go straight into it and didn't get an invite. You know, the one thing I did want to mention before even talk about the result is 
I swear there's just more and more people on the red carpet every single year. And yeah. I, it baffles me because it was a hell of a night, a long night. And I swear, I, I some people would still say, now I really admired this man's work throughout the night. But towards the end, you know, some people will say, Hamish McLaughlin is still talking about twos. <laughs> If I hear the fucking word two come out of that guy's mouth once again, I will crack the shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look, he was really good, I thought, until that point. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, that was also when he probably made his best joke, where it was the, the plugger locket one, where he was talking about how many times he's, he's kicked whatever. It was like 28, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> that was actually the one joke where I was like, Good gear, Hamish, right? Um, <laughs> but there was a point where I was like, all right, mate, just let Krimmer do his talking. Just step aside. <laughs> yep. Let's get this night going. It's already fucking one thirty in the morning. Just <laughs> let these guys go to their after party and let's just let's just go home. Basically, that was it. And, you know, I, you know, you look around the room and talk about what he did with Bobby Hill and Harley Reid and a few others throughout the night. You know, I personally thought it was lighthearted. People are just, that's what gripes me. And I've seen some people with opinions that come out and they're almost to the point where it's like, are you really in a position to be saying it should be professionally done? Like, I don't understand, you know. The but, really... hey, yeah. what no, it is. No, I think... please, go, continue. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going still. <laughs> no, that's all good. No, no, your turn. It's fine. <laughs> Taking the basement yard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, I yeah, no, please. Continue. I didn't know if you were done. <laughs> <laughs> what was yours, brother? I was literally only going to say, this year felt like the Brownlow was less like stuck up as it usually is kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know if that's the right word to explain it, but it felt very like lighthearted for a lot of it. Like it was very, very loose considering the fact that it went for six hours. Very <laughs> loose. <laughs> considering the fact that there was two songs. What is that about Jared? Like I, at one stage I was watching it and I was thinking, I thought the voice was on Sunday nights. I was waiting <laughs> for, I don't know. Abby Holmes to press the button and turn around and yes, <laughs> or on the screen, you know, the number pops up and you can vote yes or no for this performance. Like yeah. <laughs> it was bad. I um also the timing of it, like round five, they were like, and a yeah. musical performance. Like, what? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Also, Who I felt like bloke? the gap between from like round seven to round eight, like that gap or whatever it was, I forgot the count was on because it went like <laughs> It went like two songs, mark of the year, goal of the year, and like two interviews on either side. And then they were like, and now we're doing round eight. And I went, what? And I was like, where the yeah. fuck are we? <laughs> it's almost like Andrew Dillon just needed a really extended break for his voice because the first seven rounds, and we posted it out, the man was rap god. Like he was he was firing fucking motor mouth. <laughs> yeah, motor mouth. 1.5 speed I was watching. I thought we were going to be done by 9.30. I was, I was like, yeah, we're fucking flying through. I was like, this is going to be like the AFLPA awards, just like fucking wrap it, everyone's done. You know, oh. home, home in bed by 10. Absolutely not. <laughs> it was fucking then the longest drag out ever in the middle part. And that was when the most boring part of the camp was on because Krupa just decided to just fucking steamroll everybody. And I was like, oh, let's just just skip to the end. Like, just fucking just get there. Look, you're absolutely right. And Krupa did win, obviously. If, if you didn't know, Patrick Cripps. Won the round low by 45 votes. Well, not by 45 votes. He won with 45 votes. Seemed like it. Seemed like yeah, it. Well, <laughs> the bloke was getting... You remember last year how the meme was like, oh, you, Lockie Neal walked down the street, grab a coffee and walked out three votes. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's Crip has become that because 45 votes is absurd. And I know there's like 35 rounds in the year now, but it is dead set just... I don't know. I it always seems like people, and I think it's the day and age we're in, and he's a deserving winner, and I'm not going to take anything away. But we've seen games where he's had, and Dacos had it too. He had, I think Dacos had 15 against Melbourne. And 15 he got, got two, something two, up, two votes or one vote. 
I swear the umpires like just forgot which Dacos was which. Yeah. Um, but then Cripper had like 19 touches or something. I, I read somewhere it went like at 30% efficiency uh, throughout that game and got two votes. And I'm just sitting there going, I'm not going to blame Cripper for this because it's the one one constant in all of these votes, the three, two, ones, is those green little fuckwits that we have as umpires. <laughs> now, there's four on the field. I don't think they're supplied with stats anymore. No, they're not. Or at all, they never have been, actually. Um, which I think they should be. Just because mm-hmm. I think you should... They should almost do a system where they write down their votes without looking at the stats. Then look at the stats, and then they can justify their points. And if not, they can make maybe one or two changes, you know, or make the complete whole change, whatever. But obviously, we do fantasy or super coach can look at the stats and go, this boat was good, you know, and this boat was great, blah, blah, blah. But if you're having someone like the Bont have 32 and kick two and not get a single vote, or 26 and two and not have a single vote, and games are just being won by some bloke that's had 15 touches, got subbed off. Do you really think the integrity of the Brownlow is there anymore? No, I think, of like, and look, it, this is the topic every year. Like, it feels like every year people, like, at the end of it go, like, oh, we need to change the Brownlow, we need to figure out kind of thing. This year is the most extreme example of that because, one, mm-hmm. how do you break a record and come second? Secondly, how do you break the record by this? That's never. That's probably never going to get reached again. This forty-five. Don't know how the fuck it's happened originally. Like, I remember like reading things like people would have Crips on thirty-four, and people were like, "There's no way he's going to pull thirty-four. Like, he's not even going to get close to that." And then he got to thirty-six by like round seventeen, and we were like, "Oh, like, <laughs> we're pretty fucked." <laughs> and he just tore through everybody. I absolutely agree, and I think the umpire should. Put together their three, two, one without looking at the stats. Then get to look at the stats and be like, "Oh, actually, we f- we fucked that up." I think because that day cost one one hundred percent. That was meant to go to Josh because he had thirty five that day. Hundred percent, Josh was meant to have that vote. Don't know how it didn't. There's another one. Harrison Petty got three votes for a thirteen touch one goal game. Greatest thirteen touch game of all time, Harrison Petty. Well played. <laughs> you look at ones like yeah, you know, Cripps getting that, Bond not getting those ones, the Neil one from last year. The one that Horn Francis got the three when Bergman was the one that had all the touches. Those games of just bizarre. And I think the umpires need to have a look at the stats. And like people were like, oh, but then it takes away from the umpires. Like they're just going to think about the stats. They like, it's what it is already anyway. And like all the AFL player association and coach association things, like they're the same thing. They got to, they got to see the stats. Like you may as well just let them, let the umpires do the three to one system. No other award, like the coaches and the players, they don't do a three to one voting system. Everything else does it. So just, let them do their own, then let them see the stats, have a Brownlow medal adjudicator with them to be like, yep, that's all good. Like, this is your original three, this is the next three, so that they don't just immediately get blinded by the stats, like they've still got some sort of eye test kind of thing, and then fix it. Because 45, while I think Cripps should have won, and I, I'm pretty sure Pete, I think I said him or Dacos anyway, don't think he should have got 45. <laughs> that is insanity. No. Uh, and there was ridiculously high, and then also ridiculously low. Neil and Bont got nothing. Uh, you know, like, the players like this, it's just... Strange, really, really strange. I'm going to turn my light on because it's gone dark in here all of a sudden. <laughs> Just like port season. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, the one thing I did think about was, and this is my reasoning, he got 45 votes. But Cripa got over, over half of Carlton's total, total votes. And... I think that's basically because everyone else got injured. So, yeah, to me, it's just like he's gotten those votes because no one else was playing. And, like, I think, how can you how can you justify it? Like, you really can't in the, at the end of the day. Like, you sit here and you're like, well, he didn't get votes there, but he got votes here, and this bloke didn't get votes, that bloke didn't get votes. And we sat through the whole thing, and we were just there like, I can't, I can't justify it. I mean, his two vote games were... And I think a couple of them were in losses that were pretty heavy. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and argue about it because I know people are doing it and people they're like, you know, he's the worst Brownlee medalist ever. He's just, oh, well, I'm Definitely. glad they've taken off that tag of Ollie Wine. <laughs> I started. Ollie wasn't I even the worst anyway, but, you know, just give it a rest, guys. Come on, it's only a medal. 
No, no. I think he definitely deserves it. Like, that's my, my thing. He 100% deserves it. Um, you are right in that. I think the thing with Carlton is that they are obviously a very well-rounded team, but the players that they have that excel in terms of your likes of Kerno and Mackay, Weedering, these kinds of guys, they play in positions that do not get Brownlow votes. They play key forwards and key backs, and we know over history they don't get Brownlow votes. Weedering got none <laughs> this year, mm-hmm. which is the nature of the award. So Cripps is like that only guy. Obviously, Welch was injured at the start of the year. Then everybody was injured at the end of the year. So Cripps was just like racking them up. <laughs> Every time they'd win a game, he was getting the votes too. So it was just like, like I still think he deserves to win. Again, don't think he got, deserves to get 45, but, you know, Brownlow's Brownlow or Brownlow, I suppose. And, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, well, there was a couple of enjoyable things about it. Um, obviously, the, uh, we spoke about it last night. The, the, and there are, I think are quite a few recognitions on on our TikTok and socials as well. Is the the moment that Chad Warner was like, "What the fuck?" And then <laughs> the zoom out shot to John Longmill was fantastic, um, which caught everyone's mind. I think the other thing as well that caught a lot of people's minds was the red carpet and who was rocking up for their teams. Now, the one in particular thing that I pointed out was the fact that the spelling of the names is something that really stands out to <laughs> me. I just think when you're writing a list down and you're posting who's going to, to crown, you really think they'd know how to spell Drew? And it's they spelt it so weird too. Like, who doesn't spell Drew like his last name? That's the most normal way of spelling the name Drew. So the fact they went, no, nah, we go the other way. Like, where'd they get it from? I don't know who told them. Like, yeah, this, that's the way to go about it. Don't don't double check. You'll be fine. It's not like you can just open up the AFL app and just find his name right there. It's fine. You're good. Like, <laughs> it's just fucking bizarre that they did that. And like, there was some there was some serious names of the the red carpet last night. It was very funny. I found it really funny, and I only found this out today. Alex Pierce uh, took Tom Cole to to the to the camp. Because I am absolutely certain that Tom Cole went up to it at training and said, mate, I am never going to get a chance to go to the Brownlow. Please take me. And it would have just been like, fine. Like, he just took him with him as his date. Very funny. Mac Andrew just took a mate from, like, school. Like, it was just fucking... Oh, it's incredible. So good. <laughs> that's the best part about who who comes and who doesn't. Like, Ollie Wines, when he won it, took Tom Clurry. Yeah, exactly. That's like, another one. That's the example of the Tom Cole thing. It's just like taking a bloke that's probably not going to get it. <laughs> yeah, not going like, to get it. No one's ever going. And I would love to know, um, you know, some of the players that actually did get in. I think honestly, I would love to see just a list. It should be released. Who's yes. invited and yeah. the plus ones. Who the dates were today? Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. You don't have to release the wags names if you don't want to. But like, like the, players, the other players that are there? Yeah. Players, yeah. 100%. Like, it would be so good. If you were a player at St Kilda, mm-hmm. who would you bring to the Brownlow? I was going to bring you. <laughs> that's, that's like the obvious thing. <laughs> <laughs> I fell into that trap and I got exactly what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but like a player. If you're looking at the list and you go, all right. You're looking at the other, the other Saints. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of like a player that would never get an invite. Like, like if like I don't want to pick like a Steel or a Sinclair because like they're always get they'll get invited. Rowan Marshall, that kind of thing. Who would I pick? That's like a random one. I want to. I would pick like oh a Tom Campbell, 100. percent I know we just did this. <laughs> I know we just did this, but Tom Campbell would be fucking hilarious because I'm like, mate, you have done so much for every fucking team under the sun. Come on, like yeah. <laughs> you deserve it. You've been here for twelve years. Like, just come on down. You can you get your chance at Brownlow and just have a have a night kind of thing. That'd be great. Or you'd pick like Ben Patton or like so like a back pocket that is never going to get anywhere near it. You're like, come on, mate. <laughs> We're going to the Brownlow. That's really good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you take from Port? Are you picking a? Ben I was Patton. about to say Solder, not anymore. Absolutely not. <laughs> um. Just, I, I'd be one of those people that would like sit there and I'd just be like, you know, I'd pick one of the young kids. Like, yeah. I, they'd never been. And I just know for 100% they're going to get absolutely mangled. Yeah. Like, oh, I reckon Jackson Mead is a serious picker. Like, I reckon <laughs> he he can do the job. Like, I, I just, 
I don't know. On the on the piss, just give me one of those. Yeah. Or Jeb McEntee, like. Yeah, the classic, underappreciated one that you're like. You know what? You might any like one that like might actually sneak a vote because if you bring one as a date that does sneak a vote, oh fuck! Imagine that. Like imagine the scenes. Like <laughs> you the bring Saints a table last night. Yeah, I was gonna say the Saints table. Last Last night when Cal Wookie got that three and I was like, fuck, like everyone just, <laughs> everyone lost the plot. Like that kind of thing. If you brought a date that accidentally like snuck in a vote, man, you'd be, it'd be a story forever. <laughs> oh, that happened a couple of years ago too. Who got, who, who celebrated? Someone, it was a Ruckman or something, they got a vote. Yeah. Um, fuck, I can't think of it now. But I remember, I know, I know the, I, know, I just remember the whole like room being like, oh, like, what the fuck? <laughs> just incredible. Um, the one thing that I do want to touch on before we move on from the brown eye, because you know I'm pretty sure the brown eye will be done, dusted, and okay. swept under the carpet by the by the time this goes out. But also it's done to, to death anyway. But the one thing I would like to do, mm-hmm. and I'm going to release this as well. Give me your rating of Andrew Dillon's pronunciation and overall performance of his three two one announcements. So. What I want you to judge is I want you to judge his pronunciation, his execution, and his voice. Okay. Uh, pronunciation, I don't think he stuffed up. I think he was pretty good for mo- most of it. There was a few that I thought he'd like struggle and he got he got M. D'Ambrosio very, very easily. Uh, there was also some that I realized are really hard to say, like W. Day. If you have to say that really quickly, like, like he was, like at one point he went, Two votes W day, and I went, oh, not bad. <laughs> he did it pretty well. So I'm going to give him a nine for his for his uh, pronunciation. It was quite good. Execution, however, oh boy, uh, just couldn't get the pace right. I don't think, and not even just in his voting, his his counts. But I also said this at the Players Association thing as well. He's the most obvious teleprompter reader of all time. Like he doesn't even try and attempt to like look around or anything like that. He is just stone cold looking at this teleprompter and he, it's so obvious. So that, in terms of execution, I'm going to even like a four. <laughs> what was the what was the last one overall? Voice, the sound of it. How was the I don't sound? Mind, I don't mind his actual voice. It's not It's not too bad. Not not as good as his pronunciation. I'm going to even like a, I'm going to give him a six and a half for that one because I still think Gills is, Gills and, and Demetrius, I think is so iconic. I'm sure I'll get used to Dills eventually. But Gil and Dimitri are very, very iconic. So I'm going to give, yeah, I'm going to give those players above them. But I might grow into it. Who knows? What would your ratings be for these ones? You get it a 19.5 out of 30 in total. Not a, not a great result for all <laughs> so that's that's a C, C plus. Yeah, that'll work. It's a pass. Um, pronunciation. I'm going to be absolutely honest. I think between round eight and 16, I think it was about the time Port had lost like four in a row. I was just heavily scrolling through. And seeing what people, <laughs> yeah, I zoned out. And I think at one stage, Dad was like, "Oh, Bud's got two. and I was like, "Well, what round?" Like, I just had no idea where we were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his pronunciation was about an eight for me. I yeah. think it, it did the job, did well. There was no, I think, I don't think there was too many hard names that got no. votes last night, as you said, like W Day or um, M D'Ambrosio. Like that might get to be a bit of a tongue twister, but they're they're all pretty. Simple names. It wasn't a, like a J or Jajni or something like that. <laughs> um, I think his execution, you're right. The pace, he definitely didn't know how to set the tone. No. And unless he, he got given something. got given the, the tap on the shoulder, like, look, 1.5 this bitch, or <laughs> where we're going to be running overtime. Well, he just maybe it was just Hayne going up to me going, look, Gil. Gil gave me all this time, you know, can you just give me a bit more, like, razzle-dazzle to, like, fit in 15 minutes of twos? Mm-hmm. Who knows? But I'm going to give it a five. I, I think he was average in terms mm-hmm. of, of the pace. I think the middle part, he was okay because it was then like, oh, okay. But then he did get the P grips and the sign. I only got the signs yeah, he, did well. he did do that quite well. I'll give him that. And the voice, yeah, you're right. Look. I'm not turning, I'm not pressing the red button to turn the chair for it. <laughs> but yeah, six. Yeah. I, I thought uh, it was definitely something I was, it was three things I was looking at most. It was who's going to get the votes for Port, our, the polar vote multi. Yes. And 
yeah, how deal would go on the on the old on the old voice box. But overall, what's that? 13, 19. So we're about on par in terms of how we rated uh, his performance. But you're right, no one will ever be Andrew Demetrio or Gil McLaughlin. No, I think it's well. I mean, like that's the thing. It's obviously you know he's new to it still. He's trying to work his way into it. You know, I'm sure people said this about Gil when he first started, kind of thing. Uh, I just I was very I loved it. I knew that Gil Gil I think has a little bit more of a sense of occasion than 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 Dil. Like he knew when to crack a joke and when to kind of you know do what he needed to. I did appreciate that Dil was very good at the old pause, the old the old P Crips and Dacos L Neil and was very just like. Like wishy washy, which was good. Um, and then yeah, the last like three rounds after the Crips was won, he was just like fuck it, rapid fire, and went two and a half, and was just like bang, bang, bang. That's when you can go quick. I'm fine with that. Last like five rounds, absolutely speed through it. Don't give a shit. I mean, like unless it's close. When it's Crips is won up by a landslide, yeah, just just rattle them off. Doesn't matter. But like in the first five, when you're trying to set the tone for the night, trying to get your way in, I reckon that's why when the music came on, everyone was like, this is way too early because the first five rounds were just flying past, and it was like, come on, Dev. Like, give us a rest. Let the let the people enjoy it. Let them soak it in, kind of thing. It's it's going way too quick. <laughs> yeah, let me get my tweet out. <laughs> I was trying to tweet like four things at once, and I'm like, stop it. <laughs> Maybe four different devices and four hands, and just anyway, forget about it. You know, <laughs> but um, no, it's good. I think Gil stuffed up his first ever, wasn't it? I think he stuffed. He started like round two or something. I don't remember. No, I'm thinking back. I'm sure, he would have played well. Yes, absolutely. Anyway, it was a brown line. It was a um, it was a good night. So happy days. Congrats to Cripper. Congrats to Harley Reid and, and Bobby Hill for their marks and goals of the year. Happy days, really. Happy days. Friendly night's done. The, the six hour ordeal is over. <laughs> Thank God for that, huh? I even oh, like the count. Too. It's just the longest night ever. Like I, I, I do love the whole count and the idea of the count. It's just it's so long, and I'm like just real back, real back. What you considering is opening round, gather round, round twenty four. Oh, well, can't wait till Tazzy comes in. There's an extra game or something. Fuck. <laughs> we'll learn new names. Hey. Alessiani, three votes. <laughs> Jay Thomas, one vote. Ha. Present. <laughs> Present. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, imagine a roll call. Oh, that'd be so good. But then again, that would they would broadcast that. I fucking bet you. They, that should be a thing you shouldn't broadcast. But I bet you they would. <clears throat> I bet you oh, they box would have a ball. Yeah, they would go through the whole room. This who's here. This who's here. We've got the interviews. We've got the red carpet. We've got the roll call. We've got everything. Live and free on seven. <laughs> I had a brilliant idea in my head, but now I've completely forgotten it. Oh, <laughs> actually, you know, one day, mm -hmm. watching this, I watched Brownie's podcast I was looking at today, and they were talking about how delays between drinks that would come because sometimes you wouldn't get a drink for like three or four rounds or whatever yeah. and or it was only ad breaks you get deliveries of drinks and obviously they eat before and, and whatever and you'd have to really like unless you were playing grand final day you have to really amp it up and, and everything to get yourself going because as we know one drink per hour or an hour and a half is that's not work not sufficient no. um when do you think like Crown will bring in like the QR codes and the table for the fight? <laughs> I would, I would absolutely love it if like some team and on the week on on the Brownlee night it was the Saints that were like the the rowdy bunch. They were the ones that were really getting around it. I would fucking love it if you all of a sudden looked into someone's like like a like a Jack Sinclair's Instagram story or a Marshall's Instagram story and they've just posted the QR codes at their table. <laughs> <laughs> crowd and then the broadcast is panning across Ron Marshall's just got his third three vote game and there's just like 17 beers getting brought to the table <laughs> I reckon with these followings it wouldn't be 17 <laughs> beers it is just, it just like imagine the, the panning out camera and it's just like oh we're all coming in ready for the next announcement and there's like 16 waiters around the one table <laughs> and it's like oh no <laughs> 
and you've got like margarita shots, like a gin and tonic, crownies. <laughs> Horrendous. It would be someone's ordered KFC. <laughs> Deliver room like she's in the food. middle of the room. They're just bringing out more food, and it's like I really, I really don't need this. Right I've got a cheeseburger meal for a walkie. <laughs> it's Wilkie, but thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I think that's the, that's the reason meal. they wouldn't do it. That is the reason they wouldn't do it because they would just be. It'd be constant. You'd see more of the waiters going through the shots that the camera people are trying to take than the actual players. Unbelievable. Well, yeah, Brownlow Knight's done, um, and which means we get straight into the grand final now. It's all about the big game. And look, as sad it is, and we don't want to talk too much about the prelims because they have happened and have occurred, but we'll see Sydney bet Port, Isaac Haney, unreal, uh, and then probably arguably one of the best prelims in a while between Brisbane and Geelong at the G, uh, where the, the young stars for Brisbane stood up and it was just an unreal game, and being there, the atmosphere was fantastic. Ninety-three thousand people. This matchup, and you look at the prelims and the form from both the Swans and the Lions. There's always a prelim that someone gets pumped in, or is you know heavily favoured to win, or there's always a, a prelim that's really, really close. And majority of the time, the ones that come through with a close prelim actually end up winning the yes. granny. So looking at these two. Looking at the Swans and looking at the the Lions, firstly, what's your overall feeling? I mean, you put out a TikTok saying close your eyes and picture who can, who's holding the cup. And, uh, when you close your eyes, what do you see fits? Well, it goes into my tips a little bit, but I mean, at the end of the day, you look at, like there, there is so many factors that come into this, and like I know I said in that TikTok that all you have to do is just close your eyes. If you're fifty, fifty, if you're flipping a coin, just close your eyes and and figure it out. Now in my head, when I close my eyes, Callum Mills does not lift up a Premiership Cup. It, it is, but he might not play. I, that, and that's another thing as well is that he might not even play. So that kind of actually opens the door back up again, kind of things. But regardless, it's I can see the likes of a Lockie Neal doing that because. You, and I think it's also because you've seen so many stars of the game do it before that I like that Neil kind of that Neil kind of type of you know just fucking a hard nut like just does what he needs to do and just puts it and then ends up holding the cup kind of thing. I see a Neil doing that. Harris Andrews not as much. That's not really in my in my vision. It's Neil and Fagan, <laughs> not Andrews and Fagan. So I don't know how they're going to figure that out. But <laughs> they might just do Neil and Andrews and Fagan will step to the side. But either way, that is what I see more of. However, heading into this game, it's. Like I genuinely and like I have like I, I've said this about like a, pretty much a final each week. I am fucking flipping a coin. I have no idea who's going to win. Obviously, the Swans were in it two years ago. The Lions were in it last year. Swans were battered two years ago, but they were obviously a lot younger than they are now. You know, Warner, Gordon, these guys weren't what they are right now, kind of thing. The Lions were there last year. They know the heartbreak. I have no idea who is going to even really get close to this kind of thing. It's going to take. Pretty much to the day of, obviously, once you find out about if Mills is playing, once you find out how the Lions are going to do, what they can without McInerney, there's a whole lot into it. But also, the grand final is just, a lot of the time, it's it's who knows. It could be anybody because the routine leading up, the week leading up to the grand final is so different. And like I remember reading this about the Crows in, in 2017. I can't remember who it was that, was that was playing at the time. was like the lead up, I think, rocked him because he was like, it was so different to how you usually do it. You know, you train for a certain thing, then you fly in on the Thursday night or the Friday night or whatever. You know, you train at the ground the day off. But, like, with the grand final, you have to do a parade. You have to do all this other stuff. You can't train on the ground at a certain time kind of thing, and it really throws everyone off. So people that are very routine-focused struggle. And that's what I think makes the grand final so interesting, and that's why I think it's going to be a literal coin flip, and I have no fucking ideas. <laughs> the other thing as well is we've got two Victor- uh, non-Victorian sides, and... Well, the AFL will claim it's it's Fitzroy versus South Melbourne. It's I don't think they've ever I don't think <laughs> I think more non Vic people are saying that than the actual Vic people are saying. <laughs> yeah, but it's banter, you know. <laughs> but I sit here and I'm like, you're absolutely right in the routine, but now that cancels itself out because yeah, we've exactly. always had a Victorian side since two thousand and six. So you look at the routine, 
And you're just like, well, both of these sides are doing exactly that. They're flying in on the Thursday. They do the parade, their interviews and everything, and, and all the coaches and everything like that. And then they're going to do their prep work. There's not a lot of prep you probably need to do. It's just keeping yourself sane and, and warm, I think, is the main thing. We look at, um, you know, the, the way that these two sides will go. And if, if it's anything to go by the game earlier in the home and away season at the Gabba, we're in for a hell of a game. It's going to be unbelievable. Um, but I sit here and I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, these two sides are so hard luck. The, the Swans have played in, you know, the 2014 granny loss. 2016 granny loss. They've done a couple of years at the bottom of the ladder, a couple of el- elimination final losses. Uh, they lost, obviously, in 2022 to the Cats. You look at the Lions. They've done straight sets, straight sets. They've gone prelim. They've gone, um, a couple of prelims, they've gone grand final loss last year. These two sides, someone's going to have a heartbreak. And it's, <laughs> whilst yeah. it's so intriguing to me that a, a team like Brisbane you know, are on their revenge tour, as they say, but then also the Swans have this hard luck story dated way back for, for years. So I think it just comes down to, I, it's actually one of those great problems. You don't, actually don't know what it comes down to. It comes down to, I, honestly, if you look at it, the these two sides have had execution issues in front of goal. We've, we've seen that. If there's one talking point you really want to have. It's For me, it's who can execute the best on grand final day. Now, I don't know the exact weather conditions yet. I'm hearing it's it's going to be a little bit wet, an opportunity, potential wet. Who knows in Victoria, it's you could be having 15 minutes of sunshine and 45 minutes of rain and 25 degrees to 15 degrees. I wouldn't know. I've been there multiple times. But, ha. Um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy to me. And the other thing as well, we talk about, uh, you and I both have this, you know, not philosophy, what would the word be, this pleasing nature of what the MCG will look, will look like on on Grand Final Day, and I sit here and I like it's the Swans wearing their full home Guernsey versus the Lions yeah. wearing their full home Guernsey. It's going to be the maroon in the crowd. It's going to be red in the crowd. Makes me so MCG. happy. <laughs> They're playing on a green grass with green oh. umpires. Forget statistical analysis, <laughs> Jared. <laughs> The hormonal growth I have from listening and hearing that description of what this grand final will look like in itself mm. makes it one of the best grand finals yet, I think. I was literally about to say, this already in my mind is the greatest grand final I've ever witnessed because you look at those two colours side by side, you look at how the bays are going to go one by one, you look at how they just look, the fact that both were in the home, I'm like, oh my God, the, like the aesthetic in my brain is just going to be like, yep, yeah, I'm happy. And if it stays sunny, fucking, I'll, I'll watch it back over and over and over again because that is going to be the one time we get to look at it and be like, fuck, yeah. And it was like that with, with Cats in Sydney as well when it was the blue and red and I was like, yeah, like that is fucking, yeah. Mm, I just love that shit. It's so good and it's going to be incredible and regardless of who wins, I'm going to come out happy because it's going to look really good and that's all that matters to me. That's the best part. Is it just going to look really yeah. good in, in your 4K yeah. ultra high definition on KO? Well, you can't watch it on KO. It's going to be live and free on 7 or 7 plus. You know where to be. Plug us and give us some cash. The <laughs> fact of the matter is every single footy fan is going to sit there. And it's going to suck because some of the bays are going to be like, oh, you know, the members or broadcasting, whatever the allocation seats are. But, you know, the bays are going to be there and they'll do like the helicopter shot. And you're going to look into the G as Katy Perry sings Raw. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm so keen. Like, as much as I'm heartbroken from last week, I don't think Teal would have looked great at the G anyway. But yes, 100%. Isolate the two colours. Oof, just. Mm-mm. Yeah, just stupid sexy, that. some might say. Yeah, stupid sexy. Sure. And that's not even a segue. That is just simply the fact you put red and maroon in a bay. Yep. And I think, like, the thing I just appreciate more than anything is that the grand final, like, a lot of games don't do this and a lot of games can't do this because just the way the tickets are sold. But the grand final is very very different in that it is very much bay by bay. And that just makes me so happy and so appealing. Like, it's so great. And I'm very happy about it. Very happy that these two teams are getting to play. And 
I think it's also really funny that it's like, you know, the first team since the Swans and Alliance since 1899. And I saw a bunch of jokes being like, oh, party like it's 1899. <laughs> like, it's very funny. Like, I just, <laughs> there's a lot of really good stuff. And I think it's it's also just, like, it's just a very appealing thing. Like, I don't really hate either of these teams. Uh, pretty much like Geelong's not in it, if I'm being completely honest with you. I don't like Geelong. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah. But be able to see, you know, like how it is, you know, a lot of players on each team I, I like. There's a lot of players that are very, talented on each team where I'm like, I would be happy to see them with a medal around their neck, holding up a cup. And I'd be like, yeah, you deserve it. Like, well done. Good on you. <laughs> we did mention him before, and I'm sad that Oscar McInerney won't be playing because he had a fantastic year. But then again, you talk about the hard luck stories and then you talk about the opportunities that do arise. And there's always an opportunity. We saw Marlon Pickett come in and play his first game ever and win a, win a, win a medal yep. in the grand final. Darcy Fort. He's a chance, isn't he? He's a his way in. He's a sniff. Give me the whole the Fort names. <laughs> just I, I hope he plays and I hope he plays really well. That's the number one thing I want. I want him to actually have a really good game. Like if they win, I want him to be like a driving factor behind it kind of thing. Like I want him to have like blanketed Grundy and like really done a lot because now the memes would be fucking good. <laughs> It's a bit like a Billy Frampton. Yes, absolutely. It is. I already saw the memes about that being like someone is going to follow in Billy Frampton's footsteps <laughs> and become Give me a- the Billy yeah, Frampton medal. Yeah, so good. That is what it should be from now on. And we are coining it right here, right now, ladies and gentlemen. We will award the Billy Frampton medal to the player that is probably the least deserving <laughs> of anybody in the 46 to get it. Well, maybe um, not least deserve it. A biggest story where it's like, how are they a premiership player? I actually would go to back further and say it's Marlon Pickett's. Yeah, that's fair. But see, even Pickett was like very good on the day, kind of thing. Like Pickett was Pickett at least gave it a crack, you know. So yeah, yeah that's true. Billy Fanta had like three touches and one mark. Didn't do didn't do much. He was he was blanketing Harris Andrews, who still was very good. So you can call it blanketing, or you can call it getting in the way, whatever the case may be. <laughs> Completely up to you. It worked though, so well done. Fair play. But and we look at it, we sit here and every station, every TV network, every newspaper and every piece of networking, every platform is going to give their tip and their margin and their Norm Smith medal. Before we get into that, give me a player that's not going to be your Norm Smith medal winner, but it's going to give you, it's going to give their team the upper hand. They're going to be the one that's going to sit there and on their time, on their minute, they're going to be like, I'm taking this game and I'm, I'm winning this game. And I think there's teams on, there's players on both of these teams that have that capability. And I've already got a couple in my mind, but I want to know what yours are. For me, I would say for the Lions, uh, my, my pick for this is I feel like it's going to be one of the young guys that is going to stand up and prove that. He belongs there. He belongs on the stage. He would have been there last year, and he needs to kind of be like, "This is my moment," kind of thing. And the Swans, as we know, are very dangerous coming out of the coming out of the forward fifty. They move the ball very, very quickly. The Lions are not that. The Lions are a very slow moving team, kind of thing. But I think that Darcy Wilmot with the Brisbane Lions. I think when the ball comes flying into Sydney's forward line, and and obviously the Lions back line, and Darcy Wilmot is there as obviously a half back. If they are going to get anything out of this, I can just picture in my head Darcy Wilmot getting the ball at about the forty five of his own fifty. And just fucking taking off and catching the swans on that rebound and just going over and over. And I love Darcy Wilmot. I love the way he's going about it. I love the way he kicks the ball, I love the way he runs. Darcy Wilmot for me is a player that can genuinely change the game. I don't think he's going to win the Norm Smith. But if the Lions need to combat that, and Sydney are very attacking, that's that's just who they are. I think the Lions need to go quick back the other way as well. And Darcy Wilmot is going to be that kind of person that will kick start that that quick pace. Get the ball, kick it over everybody else, not do a little chip to the midfielders. Just go straight over the top to a Charlie Cameron running back to goal, a Kyle Loman, a Will Ashcroft, one of those guys that they're just going to go and catch Sydney off guard, catch them going. I think Darcy Wilmot is absolutely that chance anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, if I look at the Lions perspective, there's one person that stands out for me. And I think it would be if you need to beat the Swans, you need to make it a contested game. You need to make it. I've played on your terms, and we saw that earlier on in the year where the Lions played that chip mark, chip mark, 
you know, they've slow played their way into inside 50 and they were happy with the stoppage, they were happy with throwing or whatever the case may be. I think Josh Dunkley is the one that you look at here and you're like, you've got their Heaney, Warner, you know, all these players in their midfield row bottom, who's probably the counter opposite of what, um, of, well, he's the same player, but on the opposition side in tackling and the pressure. So Dunkley's, if Dunkley's having 10, 11 tackles in this grand final, plus having his 20, he might hit the scoreboard, playing at a half board role that he does when he rotates through. They're going to be very hard to stop. And I just like the concept of Dunkley being like, oh, you know, I'm going to stand up here and big body these bitches and absolutely ran one home. So, absolutely. Yeah. That's the thing as well with, with Dunkley. He's a big, he's, he's a big body, like you know, and sometimes you need that in that contested ball, especially when the likes of Heaney and Warner and all that are going through there. In and you said him just there as well on a, on a Swans perspective, arguably the most important player this week is James Robottom because he is that defensive midfielder, and he might not go forward and kick a goal like a Dunkley would or whatever the case may be, but he like and they they probably they won't tag a Neil or they won't tag like they probably won't tag Zorko or anything like that but he needs to be that defensive mid at that stoppage because if they're not going to tag or have somebody run with or whatever the case may be or if they're doing it to one and not the other Robottom has to be in charge of the other one and he has to be the guy that stops everything because he cannot live they can't let Neil get it out can't let Dunkley get first use kind of thing if they get it he needs to wrap them up straight away much like Dunkley if Robottom gets 10 12 tackles Sydney are in a good stead because that means that they're attacking three of, you know, Heaney, Warner, Goulden can do what they need to do by breaking off and not having to do the the, the real hard defending that James Robottom does. So it's it's going to be a very, I think, defensive midfielder game that, that will be very interesting to see. Robottom's just Swans one? Yeah, I would say Robottom would be my Swans one, absolutely. I'm going a bit left field, but if the Swans are going to go well and go large and kick a winning score, and we saw it last week, they were able to, you know, man quite well on Port's tall defenders. Joe Amati needs to have an impact. And I don't really necessarily care if he kicks one or two. That's fine. But you cannot allow someone like Harris Andrews taking intercept marks or, as you said, Darcy Wilmot or because uh, he, he does that quite a bit. You know, even Payne. Like, these players, they cannot take these intercept marks and play these slow build-up plays. So if Joel Amati's coming out, impacting the contest, allowing your Papley's Warners, Heaney's, to impact that contest, whether it's in forward, up on the wing, whatever, then if he does that and creates those stoppages or creates those opportunities for the small to kick goals, it becomes so much more of a, an open field game and the likes of Robottom can go to work on those contested stoppages or whatever the case may be. So I think Joel Amadi needs to have an impact and if he hits the scoreboard, kicks two or three, then it's three goals, 10 touches, six or seven marks, one percenters. Perfect game. He, he's had a good sort of final series. Um, and I think if he can impact it, there's no there's no way you're stopping the big Joel. You might be no. party. <laughs> that's 100% it. It's like so the Swans, that's, they can't, the Swans can't go away from what's won them games this year, which is those mids kicking goals. And they don't need Joel Amadi to kick five. They don't need him to be that big key forward. If he can do what the Pies tried to do with Frampton on Andrews last year and just halve that contest, not let Andrews take the mark, anything like that, just bring the ball to ground, let the mids then run back onto it, let Papley, let Haywood run back onto it, he's doing his job perfectly. And at the end of the day, they have a premiership medal around their neck. John Muddy has a premiership medal around his neck. John Longmire is going to go up to him and be like, you fucking did this. Like, you got us there and you helped us. If Harris Andrews has a has a quiet game, John Marty will be to thank. And that is just... That's all he needs to do. Literally all he needs to do. Barely needs to kick any goals. Just needs to do that. Interesting. Obviously, with the, the news, obviously we, we've heard injuries with uh, Oscar McInerney and he would probably be the, only, the one unlikely, well, not playing, but he's the only one probably out for Brisbane. With, same with Logan McDonald, fitness test, and, and obviously as well, Callum Mills, another fitness test. So we'll see how that pans out. But Jared, it's our last time hip this year. Oh, <laughs> it is the opportunity where this is it. This is the one. This is where you can lift the Premiership Cup. And this is the moment of all its glory. So, simply, who is your tip and how much buy? I would say, as much as the Swans have been 
the the benchmark team for this entire year. I somehow still feel like, and this is the grand final for me is you just got to tip with your heart. Like all the analysis, everything like that kind of goes out the window and you just tip with what you feel like is happening and the the the, the storyline that you think is building. I don't think this is the Swans year. As much as they have been incredible all year, I still think it's too early. <laughs> and I think they, they as this group right here, the, the team that played in that grand final was obviously a little bit different to the one they have now kind of thing. The team that's playing this year, I think, needs to feel this heartbreak before they can feel the success. So for me, I think the Lions are going to win. And I think they're going to win by three. Like It's going to be an absolute classic. Again, like we said, the colors are going to be perfect. It's going to be an absolute classic. The Lions are going to win by three. Lockie Neal is going to hold that cup. The Lions will do it. They'll avenge themselves from last year. I think that's the number one thing as well, is they have revenge on their mind. And teams can do an awful lot with that. Collingwood did it in that prelim the year before kind of thing. They had revenge on their mind all of 2023 and they got it. That's what the Lions have been doing this year. They've come from starting the year really poorly to being where they're at now. And their form's better running into it. They just fought a massive battle against Geelong where I think that game is going to test them well for this. Lions by three for me. And your Norm Smith battle? And Norm Smith, I would say... And this is because I think he probably, if the if the score line was slightly reversed last year and, and Neil had got that free kick in the Lions and kicked that goal to win it, he probably would have won it last year. I'm going to go with it this year. Joe Danaher. And the Joe Danaher is going to have a monstrous game, going to have one of his 20-plus 20, 20 disposal games where he has 10-plus marks, kicks three or four. I think Joe Danaher is going to win an awesome medal. Might have to chip in a bit of the ruck work too. So that 20 disposals does look a bit handy. And um, it was goalless last week. So interesting to see yes. one week be clutch and the NX not have an impact on the scorecard. But if they're not having a, an impact on the scorecard and, and still winning a game, then they are sound. Um, and for you? Yeah, look, similar tale. Mm-hmm. It's, I don't, I think the Swans are primed. I think they are ready to win the flag. I think the season of dominance that we've seen, and we know that teams don't always win the season of dominance that they've had, and they've had their lull. Look at Collingwood last year. You know They were able to you know, handle that situation, ended up coming out and just winning. But for me, <laughs> same concept. It's... All of this point has been building up for the Lions. They've had their moment where they just lost. That can hurt. It hurts a lot. But now they're able to you know, be hurt, but be in a position where they can make that redemption. I think you know, Chris Fagan is in a position now where he, he has that group. They have an extra addition of, of last year. Um, like you said, Ashcroft is in there as well. And these players are ready. Can they do it without a Ruckman? I think I think so. You can nullify Brody Grundy's um, you know, advantage. Who tags Sorko? Is it James Jordan? It is. Are these players? Are they going to run an offset? Are they, what are they going to do? And I think at the end of the day, the Lions have just. I've seen it. We saw it in the first game against Carlton. Saw it against the Giants in that third and fourth quarter. Saw it last week. They can be tested, they can be pushed, and they will just come back at you and they will make you look silly. So, I'm tipping the Lions by seven. I I do have a feeling that we're going to have another close grand final. We have been starved of those lately besides last year. But very well, on the other hand, I'm also thinking if the Swans win, they're going to come out with by 53 points. Like, that is <laughs> what yeah. I'm dealing with here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Lions by seven for me. I like it. I like I like the fact that it's it's either the Lions by nothing or the Swans by a lot. It's like that it was like that Hawks Dogs game in the first final. I think I said it's either going to be the Dogs by a goal or Hawks by 50. <laughs> it was always going to be one or the other and that's what this feels like as well. Um and then who do you think is your Norm Smith for this Lions by 7? Ugh. Eight picking favorites for Norm Smith. Boring. I know. <laughs> It's really, really boring. I think Hugh McGluggage is someone that could potentially be the one that, that, that 
has an impact on this game. And we've seen games where he stormed out, kicked two or three goals in in, in minutes out of the middle. Because of the last Sydney game as well. I think that's what happened. The last Sydney game was it was he took the game by storm and won it for him. So, <laughs> so you could definitely you could either shut him down. If they do, then I'm wasting money. But <laughs> I generally think Hugh McLuggage is going to have an impact. And you know. There's countless amounts of Lions players that could win this. Cam Rainer could be thrown in there. Charlie Cameron could kick five or six. Um, and obviously, the favourite could be Lockie Neal, whoever. Not a lot of for me. I like it. He, that, the Lions have a lot of those players that are very Norm Smith. Like, you can see them doing it, like a McCluggage, a Bailey. Zach like Bailey is absolutely one yeah. of those players. A Cam Rainer, a Dane Zorka. These kind of guys, they have a lot of Norm Smith candidates. And I think McCluggage. Cluggage is a very, like, leader of that pack being, like, Norm Smith is never usually the the main guy. It's never usually a Neil or, you know, or a Heaney or whatever. It's usually one of these guys that just has a fucking unreal game. And it's usually an outside player. I remember Isaac Smith won a couple of years ago. We see Bobby Hill won it last year. Like, very interesting. Very interesting to see how it goes. But I love the pick. I think McCluggage is one of those. He's classic. He's got a, he's got a Norm Smith feel about him, this year McCluggage. There's a swan. You know, you look at the other side. You can just roll off the tongue about 10 of them. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's going to be incredible. You know, who's going to stand out and going to be the best performance that we've seen in a final? And we've seen it throughout the um, the final series so far. And I guess that's what leads us straight into the glass table question of the week. Yes. So, should we go around the glass table, Darren? We shall go around the glass table, Anthony. <laughs> sound like, sound like, what's his name? Furiosa. <laughs> Chris Emsworth. Emsworth go. Are you already asked, huh? <laughs> anyway, the question we have this week is what is the greatest finals performance you've ever witnessed? Uh, obviously, I put a couple in there. Isaac Heaney's against the Giants in round one was a classic, as we know. And I also put in the Roger James final, which hurts my soul a little bit, but obviously, Cop still that. a classic. Still a classic, so that's fine. <laughs> that's part about Roger but, James is performance there and that's going to be my pick anyway um is the fact that he had i think 75 percent of port's possessions in that final in the first 15 minutes before phase gary kicked his hundred so yeah <laughs> he, yeah he did it before the momentum stopped the saints he was like i'm gonna do like i'm gonna do everything i can and then just cruise to the rest of it which hey it works you know Definitely did, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any that you like by any chance? I love the 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 instant comment from Kyrie just saying, there's so many to choose from, man. And he's a Cats fan, so he's like thrown in 15 different people. Yep. The classic. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I was going to say really that. Appreciate it. Yeah. I don't remember any of them. The Dangerfield one against the Lions, I did. That was really, really good. Yes. I did that one. Yeah. The Gary Rowan one, I do remember because I remember it just being like, you shouldn't be having a game like this. <laughs> and then he did. Also, sad news about Gary Rowan, obviously getting delisted today. Um, that's just the thing that I thought about as I saw the photo <laughs> of him. Of him yeah. Thing, but, um, I think I saw it coming. But um, yeah, the Cats, That's that fucking message shits me because there's so many to choose from. I'm like, oh, look at you winning all your finals. Are you <laughs> main finals all the time, do you? Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think- Good on you, Kyrie. I think a lot of people took this as like just teams as well. So someone just got like here, Trisha just commented just the entire three peat of the Lions, <laughs> which I mean that's fair. I mean I guess that's that's a pretty good finals performance, I would say. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stars in that in that team. Yeah, how's that? Oh, by the way, we won a three peat. <laughs> Thank you. Really good. Really starting to see a trend with these. I'm really starting to see why we shouldn't have asked this question. <laughs> I really start to see why I should have phrased it as individual performance, but I feel like even still, uh, that fo- that tweet from Trisha would have just been like Simon Black, Michael Voss, Jonathan Brown, Jason. Yeah. It would have been like, cool, thank you. <laughs> you want to see in- individual accolades and shit like that <laughs> thrown at you? It's like Oprah, but with finals performances. <laughs> Are there any others that you like at all? I think there's a few on Instagram, but I can't get that up. But uh, Promo mm-hmm. Merchant sent out the Port Adelaide versus Geelong 2013 semi-final, but it was Port Adelaide's first half. The one better one, um, if you want to talk about um, 
you know, performances like that in particular. Um, who was it? It was one of the, I think it was, it was Byron Pickett's grand final performance as well. That really stands out. Um, we talk about our players that, you know, don't always win you know, accolades and stuff like that. The impact he had on that day. I think he took like 15 bounces on the wing, just <laughs> running up and down. Taking the fun. piss. <laughs> uh, he kicked three goals as well, Manganine. So that's something I remember. But I think even uh, the performance as well that stands out for me is when the, the Hawks bet the Cats in that prelim, I think it was, or the semi final. And Bergwijn's kicked like three goals in the second half. Yeah. It, Sean Bergwijn yeah. was made for the big moments, and that was that was the biggest of moments. One, oh, I love the, it. It's the the the, the classic footage of, of him running in. It's coming in from the pocket, and he check sides it, and then the camera cuts to the other angle, and the camera is fucking bouncing. Like you could just, it is so loud in the G. It's like a genuine cauldron. There was moments like that on Saturday as well. Obviously, you're at the game, but when. Uh, when it was Archie kicked that goal to put him in front, the fucking camera was just going. Like, just they're the best moments when, like, the camera is shaking so hard that you, like, are doing it. And that Bergwijn one is one that sticks in my head so much because the noise that Hawks fans made when he fucking kicked that goal, ridiculous. And, like, there is moments like that through everything, obviously. You speak about Byron Pickett in that grand final, obviously, in the, the 2010 draw for me, like my individual one. Obviously, Lenny Hayes won the North Smith that day. was was fantastic. But Brendan Goddard's performance specifically in that second half, if not for the fucking mark alone, Brendan <laughs> Goddard was just ridiculous that day. And, like, he probably, like, he very easily could have won the norm that day. Um, And he, like, and you speak about camera shaking moments. When he, t- when he fucking takes that mark and starts walking back and then he kicks that goal, the camera is just going off. Like, it's just like, holy shit. And that's what finals performances bring, I think. Like, that's the, the nature of it all is that you know when something special, when you can see things like that happen. And, like, you know, Pickett and, and Wangani, obviously you got to see it in, in the win, which means even more because you get to, they're like the legends and obviously the Roger James one as well, which speaking of the Instagram comment, that's one of them here was Roger James 2004 prelim. And then we got the, we got someone underneath commenting completely agreed. So like that prelim is such a special thing and such a special moment. It's like the ones that they always stick out, the finals ones in particular, I feel. Yeah, shout out to my coach who commented that one, actually. I was going to say, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. That's... Uh... <laughs> A little plug for authentic, authentic growth coaching. Growth. Yeah, that one. Absolutely. <laughs> also, in in the Instagram one, we've got 2014 prelim. Just the Port one versus the Hawks. You know. Why do we celebrate losses? Yeah, well, I, I, that's that's what I'm saying as well. But this one is a very, I can say, it's a salty message because <laughs> it's versus umpires plus Hawks. Then it says infamous free kick Hawthorne game, second youngest team in the comp, lost by three. West Off would have kicked goal of the year if finals were included and Hawks won the granny the next week. There it is. Good game, though. Great game of footy. We talk about that game a lot on this podcast. <laughs> but... My favourite loss. And yeah. That sucks because it's brilliant, but the most enjoyable game of footy. Yeah. Incredible. What a game. God's sake. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty more. And we love a finals performance, you know. They really stand out. They're always fantastic. And I can see you smiling and looking up at the sky. Yeah. They're pretty stupid sexy. <laughs> stupid sexy, you say? Yeah, well, I do just to say. let you know. <laughs> We have a segment. It's called Stupid Sexy AFL Players. Play the music. <laughs> it's not really music. It's just a thing. <laughs> play, play the play the Homer. <laughs> stupid Sexy yeah, AFL Players. Yes, it's uh, time for Stupid Sexy Time. Yes. I'm just going to say Stupid Sexy Time because it's enjoyable. Yes. We all love a bit of Stupid Sexy Time. Exactly. Because <laughs> it feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> oh dear. It's great because we get to this segment. Let's look at you, and I'm just like, wow. It's like I'm wearing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've been really well behaved until now. Yeah, just about. We're doing very good, and now it always gets to this point where we always start to lose a little bit, which is fine. It's okay. Yeah. 
bring back the classic gym class heroes featuring Patrick Stump. It's time to get your clothes up. <laughs> Fucking gym class heroes. I haven't heard that name in years. Well, wow. look at my girlfriend. <laughs> She's the only one I got. <laughs> there goes the fighter. Oh, ooh. okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> obviously it's stupid, sexy time. So the question is simply, who do you have this week? This week is this week's always a good one because it's it's brown that week. So you get to see all of the all the boys that you know and love in those stupid, sexy suits wearing the you know like mm-hmm. there is well dressed as possible actually before i get into this just by the way I saw this on twitter charlie kerno right he has been a he has been a uh a staple of this podcast because of the size of his arms and everything like that don't know what's going on with charlie kerno's hair right now after this please go and look at a photo of him. he was not at his best on really night that's just another thing anyway <laughs> i first went out the night before probably Probably that's actually a good point. He was probably drinking heavily by the time those photos got taken too. So <laughs> my actual stupid sexy player, he's actually been mentioned on this podcast already, and he is part of one of the grand final teams. Uh, and are you going to just copy and paste now? I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, no, I, I'm talking about like this episode right now, kind of thing. Uh-huh. I don't know if he's been picked. I don't know if he's been picked overall, but he yeah. had the distinct pleasure of getting his first Brownlow votes uh, this year. And he actually got quite a few in the end, but it was very, very nice to see. And after he got his first round, he had a little cup of tea and he just did this little, did this nice little cup of tea and he had this little thing. And and I was like, wow, you are quite the good looking man, Mr. James Rowbottom. Don't know if he's been picked in this before, but I was just, there was some photos and, and obviously he was very well behaved, you know, grand final speaking, he needed to be very calm, but they, they did this, they did this close up on him when he got his first votes and he was just very, just very calm and distinct. And I went, yeah, <laughs> you, you actually, I like you, <laughs> and I think it's just yeah. he's a good, dude, good looking dude. He's got the long blonde hair. Yeah, he, he play and he plays a very attractive style of footy. Just like fucking hard at it. Just really works hard. Need to stop before I say anything too incriminating. But James Rowbottom absolutely is a stupid, sexy AFL player, and he was very, very good looking last night. <laughs> Like the men that get dirty, don't you, Jared? <laughs> get dirty as well, because the bottom of his name. You said it, not me, chicken. No, I did not. <laughs> Very hard at it, too, apparently. A fantastic justification of your case. I'm, uh, I'm all for it. It's fun. <laughs> Cheat on me a, all you like. Just a little hard nut. Is James Rowland? Anyway, who's <laughs> yours? Oh boy. Can I um actually before I get on to it, just quickly. Um who's number four for Brisbane? Uh he was he was there last night and he also kicked three on the weekend. Calamarch. What's his name? Bless you. Funny enough, he's also my stupid sexy. <laughs> I was wondering where that was just coming in from. <laughs> Get a fucking good run on the weekend, let me tell you. Oh, yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> just running about half of Melbourne, just going, hey, um, who was number four for Brisbane? He kicked three goals, so I was unreal. What's his name? Callum. And I'd be like, oh, I cheer. I'm like, oh, bless you. Did you get the same reaction every time like I just gave you then? <laughs> <laughs> to say I was very much satisfied with my performance. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> and I was very satisfied with his performance too. Because yeah, so. not only did he play really well, not only is he a very underrated footballer, he's got that Archie spark. 
Mm, I was going to say, is it the RT name? Glenn, but... Yeah, it's just something. And, and Brendan wasn't the worst. It's okay. Tell him, you know, when he described that his little one through a Hot Wheels car, and he got really excited with the TV, I was like, you know what? I love your enthusiasm. Uh, yeah, it was I love pretty good. Energy. Just got to acknowledge these these people and these people. And I think he he, he doubled up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Let me get you a tissue for your sneeze, Archie. <laughs> Anthony, shall provide tissues. Calibers. Sorry? For reasons. <laughs> sneezes. Sneezes, of get course. Get me a tissue for your issue. <laughs> By the way, Kleenex, you want to be a sponsor? Oh, yeah. I don't know if we said this last week, too. but <laughs> oh, No, I think we just said it just in our own private lives. But absolutely, I think we could <laughs> bring those on board. I was trying to see if I had them around. I don't. <laughs> no, and don't grab a sock either. There it is. <laughs> You've made it to this point. <laughs> Good on you, to be honest. Absolutely. We've got range. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> <We've> got... <laughs> <laughs> In what concept? Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all right. We just have range. Constant range. <laughs> the things to say that won't get me cancelled <laughs> I was going to say I feel like now is the chance for us to not jump over the line <laughs> and keep ourselves firmly okay <laughs> firmly you reckon well that's it that's, that's <laughs> stupid sexy and we're done we are we've hit our the penultimate climax of the year, per se. Yeah. It's a climax. Not really something you want to follow up after you super sexy, is it? <laughs> Definitely not the next words that should have been <laughs> that should have been said. But that's well, fine. you know what? You can always go one more time, and that's why we have a grand final to play with. Exactly. <laughs> to play with is good too. But exactly right. We get one more chance. We get to enjoy it. We get to have a lot of fun. It's going to be a stupid, sexy looking grand final. I can fucking tell you that. And we are going to be back with our stupid, sexy faces and our stupid, sexy picks and our stupid, sexy analysis right afterwards because that's what we do best. We just love the footy. I was just about to finish that. And I was like, I can't steal that. <laughs> so, and we just love the footy. So... Congratulations, Let me you mate. Just check one last thing. Yes. Before we sign off, and I just want to check one final. <laughs> Saturday, twenty eighth of September. It shall be sunny with a max of twenty two degrees. Can I say, Jared? You know what that type of weather is correct for? Fucking beers. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'll lick the stamp and scent it. Butter my butt and call me a biscuit. I'm ready to drink this weekend. Let me tell you. Yeah! <laughs> I've recovered from many, many on the weekend to be like, got on her? By the time Saturday rolls around, it's just, oh yeah. Beers, baby. <laughs> Look. I'm so it's excited. perfect. What do you have? <laughs> well, I've been free. Only on seven. Ah! Oh, my God. I'm still waiting for someone to tell me what number four is at Brisbane. Ah, uh, gee. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs>